The Etruscans were an enigmatic people that stood out from their neighbouring cultures on the Italian peninsula. From the late Iron Age onwards, their civilization, with sophisticated art, monumental tombs and skilled metallurgy emerged. There's always been an air of mystery around the geographic origins of the Etruscans. Broadly speaking, ancient writers give two conflicting origin stories. One places their ancestors in Anatolia, whereas the other gives them a local genesis. Experts have found evidence which supports both of these histories and have evolved hypotheses along those lines. For example, aspects of their material culture certainly were similar to other groups in the region. But at the same time, it appears that unlike neighbouring cultures, they spoke a non-Indo-European language, which has yet to be completely deciphered. A DNA study carried out last year may, however, have finally solved the mystery. Let's take a look at the evidence. The Etruscan culture was centred on an area called Etruria, which covered much of modern-day Tuscany, large parts of Lazio and Umbria, and smaller sections of the Po Valley, Emilia-Romana, Lombardy, Veneto and Campania. They lived alongside the Italic peoples, cultures who all spoke languages belonging to the Indo-European language family, including Latin, Faliscan, Oscan, Umbrian and Hernetian. Before we get to the DNA study about their origins, let's first look at what the ancient writers say. The ancient Greek poet Hesiod mentioned the Etruscans in his 8th century BCE text known as a Theogony. They are referred to as Tyrrhenians, living alongside the Latins, which implies they were a different cultural group, but doesn't imply a foreign origin. He says, Circe, the granddaughter of Helios, born from Hyperion, being in love with Odysseus, gave birth to Agrios and to genuine and powerful Latinos. Telegonos was born to a golden Aphrodite. Both of them live in distant lands and rule over the famous Tyrrhenians. In the 7th century BC Homeric hymn to Dionysus, the Etruscans are referred to as pirates, essentially. Suddenly, men from a galley came speeding over the wine-faced sea, freebooters from Tuscany, led on by an ill doom. In his 5th century BC book, Histories, Herodotus wrote about a terrible famine that had caused suffering to the Lydians in Anatolia. But the famine did not cease to trouble them, and instead afflicted them even more. At last, their king divided the people into two groups and made them draw lots so that the one group should remain and the other leave the country. He himself was to be the head of those who drew the lot to remain there, and his son, whose name was Tyrrhenus, of those who departed. Then the one group, having drawn the lot, left the country and came down to Smyrna and built ships, in which they loaded all their goods that could be transported aboard ship, and sailed away to seek a livelihood and a country. Until at last, after sojourning with one people after another, they came to the Ombrici, where they founded cities and have lived ever since. They no longer called themselves Lydians, but Tyrrhenians, after the name of the king's son who had led them there. So Herodotus gives them an Anatolian origin because the Tyrrhenians became known as the Etruscans. Thucydides, also writing in the 5th century BCE, agreed with the Lydian origin for the Etruscans but said that they came via the island of Lemnos in the Aegean. This is interesting because the only written language found, which is some sort of affinity to the mostly undeciphered Etruscan inscriptions, comes from a stele on Lemnos and texts of the Raetic language in the Eastern Alps. So the mention of Lemnos could be quite convincing, except for the fact the Lydians spoke a well-attested Indo-European language, and the Etruscans did not. Helicanos of Lesbos wrote, also in the 5th century BCE, that the Etruscans were descended from the Pelasgians, a name given by writers from the classical period to the ancient population of the Aegean, who, it seems, little is known about. Legend has it that they were also the builders of the Cyclopean walls, as you might know from some of my previous videos. In the 1st century BCE, the geographer, philosopher and historian Strabo wrote an account of the Etruscans in his famous book, Geography. The Tyrrheni have now received from the Romans the surname of Etrusci and Tusci. 
The Greeks thus named them from Tyrrhenus, the son of Attis, as they say, who sent hither a colony from Lydia. Attis, who was one of the descendants of Hercules and Omphale, and had two sons, in a time of famine and scarcity determined by lot that Lydus should remain in the country, but that Tyrrhenus, with the greater part of the people, should depart. Arriving here, he named the country after himself, Tyrrhenia, and founded twelve cities, having appointed as their governor Tarchon, from whom the city of Tarquinia received its name, and who, on account of the sagacity which he had displayed from childhood, was feigned to have been born with hoary hair. Placed originally under one authority, they became flourishing, but it seems that in after times, their confederation being broken up and each city separated, they yielded to the violence of the neighboring tribes. Otherwise, they would never have abandoned a fertile country for a life of piracy on the sea, roving from one ocean to another. So Strabo gave them an Anatolian origin and made them pirates as well. Also writing in the 1st century BCE, the Greek historian Dionysius of Halicarnassus discussed the various origin stories for the Etruscans and weighing up the merits of each was of the opinion that a great deal of confusion had been caused by writers mixing together the Pelasgians and the Tyrrhenians. He was quite sure that the Pelasgians were indeed foreign, but that the Tyrrhenians were native. So what does the DNA say? Last year, a paper published in the journal Science Advances detailed the DNA analysis of 82 individuals excavated on the Italian peninsula. The date range of these skeletal remains was from 800 BC to 1000 CE. A previous DNA study had shown that modern day Tuscan populations have mitochondrial DNA with an affinity to Anatolian populations. Since most of the ancient region of Etruria covered what's now known as Tuscany, it was thought these modern day people may descend from the Etruscans, thereby supporting an Anatolian origin for that culture. However, further studies found there was no genetic continuity between ancient Etruria and modern day Tuscany. The recent study analyzed 70 individuals from 12 archeological sites in Tuscany and Lazio, corresponding with areas covered by ancient Etruria, as well as 16 individuals from the medieval site known as the Thermae of Venosa in Basilicata. This study found that from 800 to 1 BCE, the majority of the Etruscan individuals analyzed had a genetic profile which was similar to other contemporary cultures in the region, such as the Italic peoples. There was no evidence for a genetic ancestry in Anatolia. This genetic profile also confirms steppe-related ancestry. This is in line with the well-known migrations into Europe that took place from the steppe during the late Neolithic and early Bronze Age, the migrations that are thought to have brought the Indo-European language family to the region. Later periods show a changing gene pool as the Roman Empire expanded eastwards and human mobility became more frequent. The study showed an influx of populations from the Eastern Mediterranean and the Near East, probably due to the Romans extending citizenship to an ever-increasing number of foreign cultures, as well as the movement of slaves and soldiers. Then, during the early Middle Ages, a genetic component was introduced from the Northern European Longobard culture. Population continuity was also identified from the Middle Ages right up until today. This means that the modern-day populations of Tuscany, Lazio and Basilicata have a gene pool that was formed in the early Middle Ages. So what this study essentially says is that both the Italic peoples and the Etruscans had genetic origins in the steppe region, probably dating back to migrations from the late Neolithic or early Bronze Age. This means that the preceding Iron Age cultures of the Italian peninsula all had similar origins. But how do we then explain that the Etruscans spoke a non Indo-European language. The paper suggests that Etruscan was a relic language predating Bronze Age migrations, which survived in spite of genetic discontinuity. This would make it a rare example of this. So there we have it, the Etruscans had steppe ancestry just as many populations in Europe did at that time, but genetics, linguistics and culture do not always go hand in hand. The Etruscans' determination to maintain an ancient language and other aspects of their daily life that they were famous for, such as their ability to interpret omens, show that genetic assimilation doesn't necessarily mean acculturation. And I'm still very interested in understanding where that relict language, as it's referred to, really came from and what else that can tell us about them. 
I hope you enjoyed this video. Please hit the like button, click on that notification bell so you know when I publish a new episode and I'll see you next time.